most churches are not run by the pastor. They usually have a staff that keep all the day-to-day -day stuff going, and they usually have a bunch of volunteers that do a lot of work to make sure all the services run smoothly, as well as all the weekly activities. And because of this, churches work really hard to make sure that they have all the volunteers they need. Whether it's through slick recruitment videos. When I say yes, it means showing up early on Sunday. When I say yes, it means making sure that everything is set up. It means setting the stage for guests to feel welcome. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I was sick. And you looked after me. Hilarious skits. We set up our cameras, removed all the volunteers, and followed a man we'll call Pete as he attended a local worship service without any volunteers. It started out like any other Sunday. Pete arrived five minutes late, as he always does. He assumed a greeter would open the door. <coughs> he assumed wrong. Uh, uh, I'm so glad that you made it. What lovely weather we're having today. Isn't this great? This is awesome. What's great about this? You don't need people. It's going to be awesome. It's perfect. This is totally impersonable. What? No, it's great. It's You're so not welcoming. It's so encouraging. It's so, and you don't need people at all. Uh, what you've told me is a joke. No, jokes are funny, and that wasn't funny. I didn't say it was funny. Then how is it a joke, then? That's My fellow Christians, I have a very important announcement. Your church needs volunteers in the children's ministry. I'm telling you. Being a children's volunteer is crucial in the battle against the axis of the evil one. <laughs> you see, it's funny because he's a war criminal. And of course, musical parodies. Wait, did I promise I wouldn't do parodies on here again? Oh well, here's one more. Will you volunteer this time? I must have asked ten billion times. Maybe this is your year. Why don't you give it a try? I volunteered a lot over my years at churches, and I had volunteer burnout a lot over the years at churches. We appreciate your volunteering. You're a very good observer, Cole. Thank you. Because they can be really good at creating an environment that takes advantage when someone likes helping out and being part of a community. You seem to enjoy your work. How long have you been a slave? <laughs> I'm not a slave. I'm a volunteer. It's to the point now where I have an instant reaction when someone asks me to help out with an event. You're actually the only parent who hasn't volunteered for anything. Okay, well you will see me at the next event. What is it, Bernie Sanders, birthday, Navajo Christmas? Sign me up. Where I feel like I'm being told that I have to do something and I start to panic a bit and try to figure out how to get out of it. When what could be happening is them genuinely asking if this is something I would want to do and enjoy doing. I pricked myself. Well, just keep working. You'll prick yourself with the antidote sooner or later. Or on the flip side, I automatically say yes to helping someone with something when I'm already feeling overwhelmed with a bunch of other things. Guess what? I have flaws. What are they? Oh, I don't know. I sing in the shower. Sometimes I spend too much time volunteering. Occasionally I'll hit somebody with my car. So sue me. It came to a point where, where I was conditioned to think that someone asking for help means that they are telling me that I have to help them. And this is obviously a huge holdover from growing up in a church. You see, we like to think of walking away from our religion as the end of a journey. Like, I'm out now, it's over. But in a lot of ways, it's just the beginning. End? No, the journey doesn't end here. And there will be things that, that insist on sticking around.
Hey, everybody, thanks for liking and subscribing and commenting and, and all those fun things that we all love doing. I also put the links down below for the social media and as well as our Patreon, a wink, wink. But uh, no, I do really appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you. Earlier this year, when everything was in lockdown and I couldn't get a haircut, I commented that I was getting quite shaggy. And my friend asked why I didn't just shave it off. Of course, I had to tell him the whole story about why I can't. You see, back in my church days, I was volunteering with a youth group, and the youth pastor told the kids, without talking to me first, that he and I would be shaving our heads in front of the church if we raised enough money for the ski trip. Now, don't get me wrong, I was never the king of cool hair. Yeah, that's Scott Bakula, no big deal. How did that get in there? I did what I was supposed to do, now why haven't I leaped? I thought it was in poor taste to shave your head as a fundraiser for anything but cancer research, especially since I had recently lost my mom to cancer and had to watch her lose her hair before she died. And for something as trivial as a ski trip when, when I don't ski. Yeah. Well, what do I do with my hands? How do I ski? Well, you're supposed to have poles. And I also had a lot of self-esteem issues and did not like the way I looked with a shaved head. And now I had to go to work and school like that till it grew in. So I said, no, no, I'm not doing that. He was the kind of youth pastor who insisted on talking to his volunteers like they were his children or that he owned them. He got the angriest look on his face and said that I definitely am. So after church one Sunday, everyone gathered in the fellowship hall and anyone who wanted to was allowed to, to help cut my hair. I never liked people touching my head because of a bully I had in elementary school, but here we were, without asking if it's okay, multiple people took turns cutting my hair. And now I can't shave my head. And it takes me a long time to find a barber that I trust. But I know an awkward haircut isn't the most traumatic thing people have gone through in a church, and it's not the most traumatic thing that I've gone through in a church. But things like that can affect you for a very long time. But there are less traumatic things that stick around, too. Growing up in the Christian subculture can be like growing up in a completely different world. You have your own shows, your own music, and clothing lines. And some of that will always be a part of you. Like, for example, catching yourself using fake swear words when you're allowed to swear now. I'm just getting really, just kind of T.O'd because uh, she hasn't even sent me a full body shot yet. I'm a cotton-headed ninny muggins. <gasps> Son of a bee sting! She's turning the entire office against us! This is locking my effing door. It was locked. I kicked it in. Why don't you just curse like other people? Or constantly singing Christian songs in the shower. No! Awesome God, Rich Mons. Or annoying your friends with VeggieTales songs. But another fun thing that likes to stick around is our gaps in knowledge. Whether it's in pop culture, because you weren't allowed to watch a certain TV show, or in science. Very grandiose thing, too. We must focus on stopping global warming, or the polar caps are going to melt, and we're all going to drown. And I just want to say, have you ever seen a rainbow? Because every time there appears a rainbow, this is the promise of God that He will never again destroy the earth by water. Relax! Science! As I began to question my faith and eventually walked away, I realized that I knew so little about science because I spent so much time actively avoiding learning certain things or actively learning wrong information. We were taught to avoid learning certain things because it would lead us down the wrong path. You've traveled to another dimension. A dimension not only of contradiction and speculation, but also one that defies logic and is based on blind faith. A journey into a nebulous land whose limits are that of imagination. You've just crossed over into the evolution zone. I love when they say that science is blind faith. First of all, no, it really isn't. Second, aren't you the ones that like faith? Isn't that like your whole thing? I remember when I told my friend that I think evolution is real, the first thing he said to me was that they haven't found transitional fossils and they never will. Which, I mean, isn't true, but it's still the main argument from creationists. There should be millions of transitional fossils. So if evolutionary theory can only suggest a few, and those few have major problems, it discredits the theory. This is what scientists actually have. Me and the monkey, apes and humans, the supposed transitional forms are what are known as the missing links. But the truth is, there is no missing link. There's nothing to link apes to human. The supposed transitional forms simply don't exist. However, fossils show that some ancient hominins were also beginning to show human-like characteristics, such as small canines that were likely used more for eating and not for hunting or fighting. 
Well, not all scientists. That would be a false statement, so it would. Well, all scientists I'm aware of. Really? So you've never read any creationist literature? Oh, I've read them. I don't count them as scientists. Ah, right, okay. And not only did I not know anything about evolution, I also knew nothing about dinosaurs. So anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, what happened to them? If the Bible story is true, as I say that it is, Noah had to have dinosaurs on the ark, so what happened to them? Science! What made the dinosaurs go extinct? Hey, uh, they're asking the wrong question. The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? But now I love learning about this stuff, and I find it so fascinating. Very long tube, um, probably extending uh, twice the size of the universe, because when you collapse the universe, it expands, and it would be, uh, you wouldn't want to put it into a tube. What you realize, though, is when you see enough creationist propaganda, most of it is them trying to debunk the claims of evolution because they think that there are only two options. Either evolution is real, or the God of the Bible done did it. Evolution, the science of confusion. Because of all the missing links, they don't know what to do. When the fact is, if they manage to debunk evolution, that just brings it back to the start, and we have to now discover what happened. But that's not how we were taught to think. We were taught to think in binary terms, black and white terms, one or the other. So just because I'm now able to find out what I missed out on and teach myself these things, that doesn't mean that the way I think changed. That black and white thinking can stick around. I remember when I first got my job as a youth pastor, I walked into my new office and there was a whiteboard there that the previous youth pastor had written on. It said, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Your opinion cannot change that. And then it said, Muhammad is in the ground. Buddha is in the ground. Jesus is alive. There are other religions, but Christianity is the true one. You see, as believers, we were really concerned about truth. We read a scripture like Romans chapter 1, verse 25 that says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. A part of us says, who would do that? <laughs> who would trade a perfectly good truth for a lie? And yet the fact is there are some lies that we have learned so well that they feel true even more than the truth does. And had real issues with people having different opinions about what the truth is or even what truth is. Descendants today would be moral relativists or postmodernists, people that believe that truth is up to the individual. You know, your truth may not be my truth. A shocking statistic revealed that 67% of Americans do not believe in absolute truth. And it's interesting because today we've got like the very real and relevant conversation of my truth versus the truth and trying to distinguish the difference between the two. And I, and I think the simplest way to understand the difference between my truth and the truth is who defines truth. Between two different views of truth, the majority view is the truth is what I want it to be. Truth is relative. Truth is, again, a matter of image or a perception. We grew up in a world where we believed that we were the only ones who had figured out this truth. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Truth is not a moving target. It is our unchanging King. And Jesus shows us that truth, truth is life giving. Because if God, if Jesus, who is the source of truth, is the author of life, then if it's true, it's gonna bring life. If it's not, then it won't. Here's why I came to the world, Jesus said. I came to the world to bear witness to the truth. That's what I'm about. And then he adds to that something unbelievable. Listen to what Jesus said. Please listen to this. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You have to have a standard for truth. And you might say, well, see, this is kind of an unfair conversation because isn't that just your truth that the Bible is real? Well, it's not even my truth. Jesus literally claims to be the truth. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. No, no. We, we all know that the Bible is real. We've all held a Bible. We know it's a real book. We just don't think it's true. 
Just because it says it's true, that doesn't mean it is true. Fargo starts off by saying it's a true story, but but it's not. You lied to me, Mr. Lundgaard. You're a bald-faced liar. Fucking please. A fucking liar. Fucking please. But my black and white thinking, or my binary thinking, did not go away. I just changed what lines I drew. For example, I think Nestle is an evil company. Now, the state has greenlit the company's request to pump even more, despite widespread opposition. And all Nestle has to pay for these millions of gallons of water it gets a year is $200. And this in a territory where Native American tribes have treaty rights. They go in and take water from places for next to nothing, places where local residents, usually indigenous people, already struggle to get clean water, or where the area is experiencing a drought and they just keep emptying the wells. There's a guy from Nestle that doesn't think water is a human right. I mean, that guy should be hunt down and shot, yeah. right? And they're gonna sit and just talk about it, talking about all the, I don't know, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, we gotta get America back to work. It's like, dude, this guy wants to own the rain. Can, can we do something about this guy? As a result, I have not had a Kit Kat bar in years. Give me a break, give me a break. Break me off a piece of that. I am totally blanking. What is the thing? Break Nobody tell him. What? No, what? But worse than that, I get really annoyed when people around me have Nestle products. And I'll explain why they shouldn't support this evil company. You see, I got this truth in my head and it became a black and white binary issue. I don't take the time to think maybe this product was on sale and it's all they could afford. Or maybe they don't see an all-out boycott as the best way to hold the company accountable. Or maybe when you look at most companies, you can see that... A lot of them are terrible businesses, or most of them are terrible businesses, or everything in the grocery store is made by a terrible business that does awful things. I mean, I drink Coca-Cola on a regular basis. To stay here, we cannot leave our homes. We will do farming here even with less water. We will use water only for drinking and we'll stop farming in case of further shortage of water. But in any case, we have to remain confined to this village only. Coca-Cola, however, has many other options to go since it's a global company which is plunging so many. But my brain still gets stuck in this I have the truth and you need the truth mindset. And I think it's probably why a lot of ex-religious people seem to be more outspoken about issues within religion than people who were never religious to begin with. Our brain is still working the same. And speaking of how our brains work, another thing that likes to stick around is guilt. I thought I'd be jumping for joy the day Skinner left, but now all I have is this weird hot feeling in the back of my head. That's guilt. You feel guilty because your stud wound up crossing a man his job. Yeah, I guess it is guilt. We spent our whole lives being told that we are awful, that we are sinners, and that we should feel bad about ourselves. You're a goddamn disgrace! And we are taught that when we feel guilty, that is God telling us that, that we did wrong. So many people, they feel guilty. Why? Because they are guilty. They do bad things. They do stuff that they regret. They have a few, and it causes them to feel kind of crummy on the inside. Why is that? Well, it's because Psalm 32 tells us that an individual who sins, who hasn't repented, it affects you physically. It just, ugh, your bones are aching and wasting away because you've got a sin that has not been repented of. That would be unrepented sin, Todd. And it actually causes you to be blah. I find a lot of people will accuse Catholics of having this kind of sense of be being preoccupied with guilt. And it's probably relatively accurate, but it's funny, you know, um, whenever you watch a TV show or see a movie where they're talking about Catholic guilt, you know, Catholic guilt this, Catholic guilt that, it's funny, my mom always says, like, there's nothing Catholic about guilt, it's just guilt. Like, if you've done something wrong, then you should feel guilty, right? I mean, that's kind of, kind of how it goes. But if you support the Catholic Church, isn't that like the same thing as being an R. Kelly fan? <laughs> see the difference <laughs> only like one's music is significantly better then you walk away from this teaching and you realize oh this thing isn't wrong and you do it and then you feel guilty for that thing that you don't believe is wrong whether it's having a drink for the first time getting that first tattoo or exploring your uh, downstairs parts so is this your first time yeah and you need me to teach you exactly well i'm a very strict teacher oh i don't like that and you start to ask yourself, if I don't think this is wrong anymore, 
Why do I feel guilty? Is God trying to tell me something? Is this actually inherently bad? Or have I just been told my entire life that it is? We have a solution as Christians. Jesus came to deal with our guilt. A great conversational question to ask non-Christians or atheists is to ask, what do you do with your guilt? Why do you even feel guilty if there is no such thing as objective, moral, right, and wrong? So to believe in objective guilt means that we also believe there's an objective right and wrong. To believe an objective right and wrong means that we believe there's an objective moral law. To believe in an objective moral law means that we believe in an objective moral law giver. This is so ingrained in me that when I started to think about it for this video, I started thinking about how awful those feelings of guilt can be, and I started feeling the symptoms of guilt just by thinking about guilt. And it kind of ruined my night. Yes, there are times when you should feel bad for what you did because it hurts someone and you should do what you can to make it right. But most of the time when those guilty feelings come up, it's not because our body or some supernatural means is trying to correct our mistakes, but because at some point, someone told you that this is the feeling you deserve in this moment. Hey John, it's me, Gazorpazorp Field. Boy, f you John, you dumb, stupid idiot. Come on, Gazorpazorp Field, go easy on me, huh? You and it doesn't matter that you know that objectively this thing you're doing is fine. You still get that pit of your stomach reaction to it. Something that helped me with this is the fact that people who are raised with different beliefs feel guilty for different things. People who are raised in a belief system where it's wrong to eat shellfish get that feeling when they eat shellfish. But people who weren't raised in that way don't get that feeling. Well, I almost tried the lobster. But Kramer stopped me. Well, I knew you'd regret it for the rest of your life. Women who are raised to believe that they should only wear floor-length skirts will feel guilty the first time they put on pants. If it was really the Holy Spirit convicting us, it would be way more universal than that. So we're left with the task of retraining our brains and our bodies that when you get this feeling, you don't give it the credit it doesn't deserve. Just tell yourself that it's that dumb Sunday school teacher talking or that youth pastor talking. Disrupting the class, telling the other children that, that God has a special plan for you. What kind of nonsense is that? And what kind of nonsense is this? And don't validate that feeling. And of course I have to mention the best friend of guilt, the good old-fashioned fear of hell. God sees the wicked one. Eternal damnation is upon the sinner. The stench of rotten flesh fills the air. Judgment is upon us all. How will you be seen in his eyes? He pointed right at me. He sure did. No! I have talked about this before, but the fear of hell is such a strong tool for keeping people in the fold. It's probably the number one weapon in their arsenal. Horrible place. Hell is described as eternal fire, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Unquenchable fire, Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. Shame and everlasting contempt, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. A place where the fire is not quenched, Mark chapter 9, verses 44 through 49, and everlasting destruction, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 describes hell as a lake of burning sulfur, where the wicked are tormented day and night forever. And like guilt, an awesome God by Rich Mullins, it gets stuck in your head long after you still believe in the message. So hell is also a place of eternal punishment for those people who wanted to live a life in sin. And Jesus also says in Matthew 13, verse 49 to 50, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We would learn how horrible it is, and also why it's so great that a loving God would send people there. The truth of the matter is, Scripture says there is a standard, the standard is holiness, and when we don't hit that standard, we sin. And here's what we have to understand. It is impossible for God to be holy without also being just. Wickedness and evil must be punished. And you feel this way when someone does something, you say, that should be punished. All right, you can boil a child in a bucket full of breast milk. Yeah, that's a sin, of course. But you can't wear polyester? We're covered in polyester. That's why. Isn't there something in the Bible about turning the other cheek and forgiving 70 times seven? God is loving, yes, but that's not all he is. 
He's also a good judge. Should a loving human judge allow criminals to go free? Of course not. If we with our finite justice system think it's necessary to punish criminals in civil court, how much more should an infinite God judge our crimes, our sins against Him? I don't know if the American justice system is the example of justice you think it is. This kind of language about hell being divine justice is used to argue why it's okay that a God made a place so vile. The first reason hell exists is that it exists for God to righteously punish Satan. The second reason that hell exists, and this is difficult for us, but it exists for God to righteously punish evil. And that would be for those of us who have sinned and who are without Christ. For those who sin without Christ. The Bible tells us that God prepared hell for the devil and the fallen angels after they rebelled against him. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Those who refuse God's offer of forgiveness will suffer the same eternal destiny of the devil and the fallen angels. Just because it was made for Satan and the demons first and then he decided we should go there too, doesn't make it a less evil plan. An infinite punishment for a finite crime is in no way just. If a person has lived their life in rejection of good at every sequence and every exchange, then that will eventually lead to a permanent rejection of what is good, which is love of God and love of your neighbors. And when you understand it in those terms, you should begin to understand that those finite sins, they weren't actually finite. Goodness is not a finite thing. It's something that transcends all space and time and quantity. So to reject it is to reject something that has eternal value with the eventual outcome being the permanent loss of an eternal thing. Against God, Psalms chapter 51, verse four. And since God is an infinite and eternal being, only an infinite and eternal punishment is sufficient. Hell is the place where God's holy and righteous demands of justice are carried out. Hell is where God condemns sin and all those who reject him. It doesn't take long to see that this kind of thinking is word salad. This is all trying to put a square peg in a round hole of a loving God sending people to eternal punishment. God and man's natures are opposite. On the day of judgment, sinful man will not be able to stand in the presence of a holy God because of their opposing natures. Hey, we're ready to do that video about uh, school lunches. Oh shoot, it was changed to talking about eternal torture. Oh, it's just I made these graphics with a lunch pail and an apple. I mean, we could still use it, but we're talking about eternal torture. It'll work. The issue is not God's love. The issue is his holiness. He is described as a consuming fire who dwells in unapproachable light. In our sinful state, there is no way that we can approach him. Our only hope is to somehow take on the same nature as God. We must be born again. When we turn from our sins and we- You see, it's all about being born again. God invites us to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, accepting his death as the full and just payment for our sins. God promises that anyone who believes in Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 16, trusting in him alone as Savior, John chapter 14, verse 6, will be saved, meaning not go to hell. You see, it's not punishment for sins. It's punishment for not believing in God or believing in the wrong God or believing in a God that has most of the same characteristics as the right God, but being off in a few key doctrines. So it doesn't really matter what you did as long as you believe the right thing, at least by the end. But now that you no longer believe in God or, or you don't know what you believe or you're questioning your faith, the fear of hell still finds its way to creep back into your mind. You'll be walking along, living your life, and then all of a sudden this thought hits you. Wait a minute, am I gonna burn for eternity? Hello? Yeah, hey, how's your torture going? That's you guys! What? Phoning it in! Oh. Open up your books, your torture manuals to chapter one. Oh. Understa Don't even start with me. Understanding your pitchfork, let's go! But like most of these things that stick around, we can get rid of it. Not the music thing, that will be with you to your last breath. You will be singing Jesus Freak on your deathbed. But when the fear of hell comes up, remember that like guilt, this isn't the Holy Spirit trying to get your attention, it's those voices from the past. Also look into the history of hell and how much of a Frankenstein's monster of a doctrine it is, pulling bits from here and bits from there. Did you know that a hell is also known as Hades, Sheol, or Gehenna? And it is mentioned over 50 times in the Bible. And you know, it's interesting that Jesus himself talked more about a hell than he did about heaven. 
These are actually different words that refer to different places. They aren't words for the same thing. I talked about it on the grief video, and I did a podcast episode about hell. So if you want more information, I'll put the links down below. But it was decided later that all these words mean hell. And it actually doesn't really make sense in context. <laughs> well, if you, if you read it out of context, there's no right context. <laughs> Strike that from- And then by the time the New Testament came around, views of the afterlife from other religions had been incorporated. The doctrine of hell as we know it is a mashup of misinterpretations of the Bible and later works of fiction like Dante's Inferno. This place does not exist. Who would have thought hell would really exist and that it would be in New Jersey? Actually, and you just have to remind yourself of that when these thoughts pop up. And it won't be easy and it won't just go away overnight. But just remember that it's just something that's sticking around from an old life. And there will be other things that stick around too. Probably too many to count. Definitely too many to put in a video. Some will be unique to you. Some will be unique to certain denominations or religions. But the key is to keep working on yourself. Keep acknowledging when something is a holdover and needs to go. Be kind and be patient with yourself and others who are going through this. And remember, it's a process. As they say, the set of HBO's Rome wasn't built in a day. These things take time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for making it this far. I do really appreciate you. If you know someone who might benefit from this, send it their way. And uh, thanks again. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> Whether it's through slick recruitment, whether it's through slick recruit recruitment, recruitment, whether it's through slick recruitment, recruitment videos, whether it's through slick recruitment, recruitment, why can't I say recruitment? Whether it's through sick recruitment, sick, whether it's through slick, whether it's through slick recruitment video.